Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to Woodland Wildlife Wednesdays. Uh, I'm excited to be here. This is our last Woodland Wildlife Wednesday for 2021. How sad is that? But I'm looking forward to our next season. And what I will say is that I love that this uh, is our last one because um, our guest speaker has worked hard over the season to, um, to collect this information to share with us. So I love capping it off with the forest health report that we have here. Um, so today is Maryland's uh, forest pest update for 2021. And as I said, 2022, we're looking forward to our new look we're gonna have for Woodland Wildlife Wednesdays for 2022, and maybe a slightly new title. We might be calling it Woodland and Wildlife Wednesday, Wednesdays. So join us for 2022 to, to see what we have up our sleeves. My colleague Luke will be joining me next year. So um, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a great year. So uh, this webinar is being recorded. You can find our recordings at umd.edu backslash woodland. So um, if you're wanting to refresh or you miss uh, me and Heather, you can definitely rewatch this video as often as you like. So uh, I'm your host, Agnes Kedmanitz. I work for University of Maryland Extension. I coordinate the Maryland Delaware Master Logger Program. And I also uh, do landowner outreach. So if you have any woodland questions or questions about your trees, uh, I'd love to talk to you about them. I may not have all the answers, but I know people like our guest speaker that have some answers. So um, I'd be happy to join you and talk to you. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have any good jokes about insects or trees, uh, if you're watching this and it's being recorded, email them to me, that's fun, um, or put them in the chat. Uh, the benefits of registering for today is uh, you get the quarterly newsletter. You can opt out of that by emailing Pam Thompson. So without further ado, let me read the description of their forest pest management, their forest pest update. So forest pest management section of the Maryland Department of Agriculture surveys for numerous invasive and established forest pests throughout the state. Based upon these surveys, treatments for hemlock woolly gelgid, uh, gypsy moth and emerald ash borer are proposed and implemented. Our survey results and treatment methods, both chemical and biological will be discussed today. Surveys for exotic Asian defoliators, oak decline, beech leaf disease, Walnut twig beetle, saltwater intrusion, and southern pine beetle will also be discussed. You guys, uh, I'm really interested in all of these subjects. So uh, I'm looking forward to today's talk. I, our today's talk is with Heather Disk. You may remember her from doing our 2020 forest health update. So Heather Disk is the forest health entomologist for Maryland Department of Agriculture. She's uh, of the forest pest management section. She's involved in coordinating and compiling forest health surveys throughout the state and implements them on the Eastern shore where she's the regional entomologist. Heather previously worked as an entomologist for the Delaware Department of Agriculture where she assisted with native bee nursery and CAPS surveys. Heather received her bachelor of science from Mearst College and her <laughs> Master's of Science from Towson University. During her downtime, Heather runs marathons, fosters kittens, and tries to wrangle her two children. So we're excited to have Heather here. So we found out a little bit about Heather. Let's find out uh, a little about you. We wanted to see that, uh, you know, I'm from the Eastern Shore. I live in Talbot County and um, this is where we'd get to know people. So um, we're hoping that you're all are from all around. So without further ado, why don't I stop sharing my screen and welcome Heather to the program today. And she can share her screen and we can get started. So welcome everybody. So we're gonna jump right in. So first I am going to talk about um, Lymantria dispar dispar, which is the insect formerly known as gypsy moth. 
So um, the Entomological Society of America has decided that gypsy moth is no longer going to be the uh, accepted common name for this insect. And so currently um, we are just using the scientific name while um, the debate for the new common name is um, being discussed. So uh, why the second disbar? So it's actually the author of the insect. And that is because Lymantria disbar is also the scientific name for the Asian gypsy moth, but has a different author. So that insect would be Lymantria disbar asiatica. So, um, in the future, as uh, we're moving forward, if you see Lymantria disbar disbar, it's talking about the European gypsy moth, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So um, in the past year, you can see um, what our totals across the state look like. So uh, we did 8,347 surveys throughout the state. You can see 6,811 of them were on private and county lands. 1,836 of them were done on state lands and that we saw about a 6% positive rate for those surveys. And that is up from the previous year, which we saw about a 3% positive rate. So uh, gypsy moth egg mass surveys are being completed as we speak. Um, we are currently finding high populations in Somerset, Worcester and Wicomico counties, as well as increasing populations in Garrett County. And so what these egg masses look like is you can see them here on this bark of a tree. Each one of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, is an individual egg mass that would be counted. Here is the female gypsy moth and what the male gypsy moth looks like. And then here are what some early instar caterpillars look like. Um, survey results from across the state kind of look like this. You can see the green is where we did not find any egg masses, pink or that I guess it's kind of looks like a light color there. That's where we found some egg masses. Orange was where we found egg masses that were approaching suppression levels and red was where we found egg mass counts that were at suppression levels. So you can see here and a little bit here is where we found populations that were at suppression levels. So what that looked like is one, two, three, four, five, six blocks that were proposed for gypsy moth suppression um, this past year. The winning bid was from helicopter applicators. So we ended up having a um, helicopter that sprayed these blocks with BT. And so what we do for suppression is we make sure that caterpillars are in that small stage that you saw in the picture prior. And uh, so they need to be consuming leaf material at the time of the suppression. We spray the BT on the leaves. The smaller caterpillars will consume the leaves and then die. Kind of their guts kind of um, explode from the inside out. And then um, hopefully the end result is that trees will not be as defoliated as they could have been in the prior if there was no suppression done. So um, in um, so that's so in total we sprayed about 530 acres this year for gypsy moth. Um, additional ways that you can try to um, take care of gypsy moth is with barrier bands. Here you can see a sticky band. You could also use um, the same bands that are being used for spotted lanternfly and or burlap bands. So basically you're trying to restrict the caterpillar's movement up and down the tree. And so as the caterpillars move up and down the tree daily, you wanna try to stop them before they're able to move, continue to move back up the tree. Um, in addition, when you have burlap bands up, gypsy moths will um, come out of their pupil form and into their adult form, and they'll often lay egg masses underneath of the burlap bands. So then you can move the burlap band and remove all those egg masses um, from your tree. Um, in addition, we do have two uh, native, or two, um, one's native, um, one's non-native um, natural enemies, <laughs> sorry is the word I was looking for. Uh, so it's the uh, gypsy moth fungus or the entomophaga mimiga fungus, as well as a nucle nucleopolyhedral virus, the NPV virus. So they're typically in our environment and that they are what typically keeps our caterpillar populations low. And uh, you can see them here. They're, all of these caterpillars were killed either by the fungus or the virus. 
the different ways you can tell is, is that if a caterpillar is dead and is attached to the tree in an up and down vertical position, then that caterpillar has been killed by the Antimophaga mammiga fungus. If it's in an upside down V, this is killed by the virus. So V for virus and then, verti and then up and down for the fungus. Uh, unfortunately, this year we did not see um, any fungal activity. And so whether that be because of the weather, um, which is most likely, there was, an, there was just not enough um, cool, cool and wet mornings uh, to be able to allow the fungus to be able to replicate enough to be able to kill the amount of caterpillars that were found um, is the most likely scenario. But unfortunately, there was just not that much fungal activity. Um, there was some NPV virus activity, but not a lot. Typically what happens is, is that the virus uh, will build in building populations. So as a population grows larger and larger, then the NPV virus also grows, replicates, is able to take out larger numbers once the population grows, which we of course don't really want it to grow. So what is the situation this year? So unfortunately, this is a map here of every, um, we did take a aerial flight in June of 2021, and we found 30,000 acres of gypsy moth defoliation. So you can see the heaviest defoliation is those dark pink colors, and they're um, here from Whaleysville down towards Snow Hill. The uh, green colors are from a moderate defoliation, and then blue and purple is a uh, is a lighter, moderate, a light to moderate defoliation. And so you can see here, this is where the majority of the trees were heavily defoliated. Here's where we see a moderate defoliation as well as here um, in Somerset County. So all three of these counties have seen defoliation and this is also where egg mass populations are very high currently. And that is most, like, most because of the lack of fungal activity this year. So all those caterpillars didn't die. They were able to turn into moths, which then were able to turn into more um, egg masses for the next year. So we are currently um, expecting about a 10,000 acre suppression program in this area, um, west sort of um, east of Salisbury and then south towards Pocomoke City and Snow Hill. So what else uh, do we look for? So we do look for the exotic Asian defoliators. So this would be the um, Asian gypsy moth, the Ly Lymantria dispar asiatica, as well as seven additional Asian moths that could come in due to uh, transport supplies from um, far western, far eastern countries. So we, um, you know, the main uh, reason that we're doing the survey is because of the Port of Baltimore. So the Port of Baltimore has found Asian gypsy moth egg masses in prior years on vessels. And so we set up our traps along the main um, thoroughfare for the Chesapeake Bay into the Port of Baltimore, as well as at the Port of Baltimore, along the canal, along the um, train depot in Allegheny County, as well as in Garrett County, where there was a uh, population of gypsy moths that um, did not look to be completely European. And so, um, you, typically the Asian gypsy moths look a lot like European gypsy moths, and so it, they're just usually a different size. And so we um, set out all these traps, and then we collect moths, and then we send them off to um, have the uh, Otis uh, lab, which is part of the USDA APHIS group. And so they do, um, um, they do testing to make sure that we know which biomarkers they are, if they are Asian gypsy moths or if they're European gypsy moths. So, so far, all of our traps have come back as European gypsy moths. So that's really good news. And no other uh, target pests have been found. Um, moving on to walnut twig beetle. So walnut twig beetle, you can see here, they're very small. They also have very small exit holes. And so what we're using to trap them is called a lingering funnel. It's this trap here. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight funnels into that funnel into a cup. So here's what walnut twig beetle looks like when it is blown up underneath the microscope. 
So these are very small bark beetles. They are native to Arizona and California. Um, this beetle was first identified um, causing issues in walnuts in Colorado. And so um, that it then was found in the Eastern states in Tennessee, you can see here in 2010, Virginia and Pennsylvania in 2011, and we found it here in Maryland in 2013. This bark beetle is associated with the Geosmithia morbidilla or thousand cankers disease fungus. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. So this beetle is no longer than two millimeters. As I said, it's very small. And you can see here, you can see exit holes, bark cracks due to the beetle activity. Um, those are all signs that um, the beetle is active. Thousand cankers disease, this is what it looks like here. There's lots of different exit holes. And then basically what happens is the geosmithia fungus that's associated with the walnut twig beetle, the walnut twig beetle brings it in, the fungus is colonized around the egg galleries and the larval tunnels. And then as the fungus grows, so do these cankers that are associated with the fungus. And then as you know, these beetles are very small, lots of them build up. And so it's basically a death by a thousand cuts. And so this disease was first recorded, like I said, in Colorado. These were in Eastern walnut trees, Eastern walnut trees, yep. And uh, they were planted as ornamental trees along streets in Colorado. And so this fungus took out the trees very quickly. Um, and, uh, but we have not seen that kind of mortality here in the East. So the symptoms for TCD are, you know, yellowing of upper leaves, leaf wilt, dark amber stains along the branches, um, but, um, you know, as well as, the crown dying back in general, then leading to mortality. But here in the East, we've had uh, walnut twig beetle identified since 2013 and thousand cankers disease since 2014. And all of our walnuts are still looking healthy. So the idea is currently that in the East, um, there might be enough natural enemies and our environment is more well suited for the Eastern walnut. And so, they're just not, the beetle and the disease is just not able to cause the type of injury to the trees that it did in the West. So that's good news for us. All right, so um, where we've been trapping for walnut tree beetle, you can see all of our traps from across the state. This year, our only positives were one in Baltimore City here and one in Anne Arundel County here. And so this Anne Arundel County find right here is the first find in Anne Arundel County. We have been surveying the walnut trees to see if we needed to send off samples to um, look for a thousand cankers disease and the trees are all looking healthy so there's no um, there's no no availability to test for the disease so good news for us so um, there is a quarantine so you can see the quarantine here along pieces of Baltimore County and all of Baltimore City um, currently, it, there is no talk of expanding the quarantine into Anne Arundel County because that we have not been able to find thousand cankers disease. So where else is there a quarantine? So also Cecil County, which is where we first found the disease in the beetle in 2013 and 14, is also quarantined. And so here are the two areas. Um, oh, and I guess we're moving along. So Cyrex wood wasp. Um, Cyrex wood wasp is a large sericid. Um, it is uh, a non-native. It is native to Europe, Asia, and North Africa, and is currently found in Northern Pennsylvania and New York. And so this tree is in Northern Pines up there and it's not causing that much damage, which is great. However, Cyrex has Cyrex noctilio, the Cy this Cyrex wood wasp, is known to cause issues in um, Loblolly pines and in more Southern pines. And so because of that, we survey for the, this pest. Here's what it looks like. You can see it has this long ovipositor. It is a fairly large wasp. The preferred hosts you can see here, um, pine, all pine species, but also Scott, red, 
um, Austrian lob lolly pine, which I mentioned in Monterey. There's other um, non-pine hosts, so spruce fir, large Douglas fir, and then you can see here the additional pine species at risk. Um, so, you know, we have been surveying for this pest, but we have not found it. And so here's where all of our all of our traps were. These are also in lingering funnel traps. So the funnel trap is baited with a um, dead tree smell. <laughs> so it's called alpha beta um, pinene. And so um, it's supposed to mimic a tree in decline. And so that's something that these wasps should be attracted to. So it, they should be attracted to our traps. Um, we did find a native sericid. Um, so this is Eurocis crassioni um, here. You can see it's a little bit different from Cyrex. It has this um, brown in, coloring in the legs, as well as the abdomen, um, and um, a lighter color also along the antennae. Um, so this was found in Hartford, Somerset, Calvert, St. Mary's, and Allegheny counties in 2020. Um, so the good news is, is that there um, is, has not been any Cyrex noctilia that's been found in Maryland currently, and um, so only native sericids. Hemlock woolly adelgid. So we treat for hemlock woolly adelgid. The majority of the hemlock trees in Maryland are in Garrett County, although we do treat in all of our regions. Um, here is what hemlock woolly adelgid looks like. With our treatments, we do both soil injections and trunk injections. So uh, the soil injections are done at the base of trees, and then the trunk injections are done. Um, you, we drill a hole into the tree, put a specialized plug in. The plug then connects to a needle. The needle then um, is attached to these uh, here, these lines here. And then that line is led from a pressurized central system. So we pressurize the central, central system with a bike pump and then open the needles and it flows through the lines and into the tree. Uh, we do the trunk treatments in areas that are close to water sources. So any type of body of water, whether it be a stream, a vernal pool, um, anything like that, we will, within 50 feet of that body of water, we will do trunk injections on trees and then soil injections after that. So even with the pandemic, we were able to trunk inject 686 trees in 2020. Um, we were able to um, do soil injections on 2,970 trees. And the kind of really fun, interesting thing to look at is that since 2004, we've been able to treat over a million inches of DBH of hemlocks. And so that totals to 106,698 trees. So um, this year in 2021, we have been able to increase our hemlock woolly adelgid treatments. Um, like I said, 2020 was really hard due to restrictions and we also lost our entire spring system, spring season for treatments due to COVID. Uh, so where are all the stands that we treat located? You can see we do have two of them on the Eastern shore. One is at Pickering Creek and one is at Y Island Natural Resource Area. Um, we do have our most southern point is here in Calvert County. That's at um, a, a hemlock preserve that was once owned by the Nature Conservancy, is now owned by a, natu a uh, natural county conservation group. Um, the rest of our areas- I found this on the web. Oh, goodness gracious. Here's my watch. Um, you can see we have you know, plenty of stands that we're treating in Central and then even a few in the Northeast area. And then, like I said, the majority of our hemlocks that we're treating are out in Western Maryland. Where did we tweet? Where did we treat? In uh, here we have the fall of 2020 through 2021. Um, you can see we treated at all of these locations, um, varying things. Um, and so for this time period, um, because this also has the spring uh, treatments that I didn't have in the previous table but we were able to treat uh, 6,691 trees in that fiscal year.
So that's pretty exciting. So we were able, like I said, we were able to come back and start treating more this year. We also release predators for hemlock willow delgid. So you can see here on the left, we have uh, two Laracobia species, two Skimnus, and, um, and an additional species. So the majority of what we're releasing right now is Laracobius nigrenus. Um, we do have some Laracobius osakensis releases. You can see those are the purple triangles. We release less of those than the nigrenus, but that's because we are able to have a Laracobius nigrenus population in Rocky Gap State Park that has grown so much that we actually have an insectary. And so we are, um, the habitat is just right. There's a really great amount of small and large hemlocks that um, have this beetle being able to um, reproduce really well. And so then once populations grow, we are actually able to take some of the beetles out of that location and move them into other locations across the state. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so here you can see the total numbers that we've released uh, since we began doing releases. Here you can see this is the Laracobius nigrenus beetle. And then this is um, the very scientific cup method. So the beetles are inside the cup, then it's um, attached to a branch on the tree. And so the beetles are able to move out of the cup and onto the branch and then find ovisacs to start um, consuming. So here we have, um, you can see here, the majority of what we're releasing is this Laracobius nigrenus. We have released 28,805 of them um, across the years. Um, moving on to beech bark disease. So this can cause mortality and um, in American beech, there are beech that are able to resist the infection. Um, it is a disease complex, just like some of our others, where you have an insect and um, a fungus. And so this has beech scale and it has um, beech bark disease, which is a nectria fungus. And so um, the scale then weakens the trees and then the fungi is able to come in. And um, the one of the main issues with beach that have been infected with beach bark disease is that they can snap um, due to being weakened by the disease and insect. And so it causes hazard trees. Um, so unfortunately I don't have any um, personal pictures of this, um, but here is a heavily infested beach um, tree. It's all of that white that you're seeing are, is all scale, it's not pixelation. The fungus then looks like this kind of like um, copper rust colored fungus um, that then attacks the beech tree. And then this is um, a small tree that has bark that has been disfigured due to the scale and the fungus attack. Where is beech bark disease currently in the state? So it is in um, Garrett County. So we have been doing um, beach surveys across the state, but Garrett is the only county where we are currently seeing active scale infestations. Then scale and cankers are here up in that um, northeast corner, as well as one site that was positive for beach bark disease in 2020. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a very active fungus in the state right now, but there is the possibility you can see all of these scale insects that have been found. And so there's a larger possibility for it to cause more issues. Now, the big thing that everybody is wanting to talk about is beech leaf disease. And so one of the reasons why we're doing all of those, um, we were able to look for all of those sites that you saw in Garrett County is because we're serving for beech leaf disease. So this is currently found in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and Ontario, Canada. It's also unfortunately, um, as of the time of this presentation, also found in Virginia, um, just outside of DC. And um, the areas in Pennsylvania are increasing as well as Connecticut. So um, this 
affects both um, native and ornamental beach species. It is associated with a nematode. Um, they're not saying that the nematode is 100% what's causing those issues, but it does look like the nematode is found in almost a 100% of the samples where you're seeing disfigured leaves. So what does beach leaf disease look like? It looks like these um, discolorations in between the veins and call it leaf, leaf striping. It also can cause curling in the leaf, which you can see over here in this top picture, a leathery texture. So the, the leaf will actually, um, it will look like leather. And in addition, you have reduced leaf and bud production because of the disfigurement from the nematode. So the thing is, is that this disease can be seen all season. So even once the leaves drop off of the tree, you can still see this intervenal striping um, can be found on the leaves that are on the forest floor. Um, it is best viewed underneath on the underside of the leaf. So if you're looking at a beech tree, you would wanna get underneath of the tree canopy and be able to look up and use that sunlight to help filter through. And that's what you were showing here on this picture is you're able to see the striping through the leaf. And even in low light conditions, you can still see it. Uh, young trees are affected um, far harsher and uh, they can be killed within one year of infection. And so a lot of what um, they were seeing initially in Ohio where this disease was first found was the, um, that the beach um, understory was completely gone. And so um, that is unfortunately a first symptom of beech leaf disease. Um, immature trees, um, it hasn't quite been that six to 10 years. So they're estimating mortality for mature trees in six to 10 years. So where have we done beech leaf disease survey um, across the state? Uh, these are, this is not a complete listing, but this is the complete listing that we were able to download from um, our survey website. And so, you know, we've done a lot of surveys across Maryland and uh, we have not found any beech leaf disease either in 2020 or in 2021. We also have set up permanent plots. So these permanent plots, we take a lot of different um, data. We measure trees, we look at tree health, other factors, other trees that are in the area, saplings, seedlings, and mature trees. And we are monitoring them um, every year, as well as taking climate data. And so you can see where we have set up, set those up across the state. And uh, within these permanent plots, there was no beech leaf disease found this year. So currently Maryland is still free from beech leaf disease. Another topic that people are wanting to talk about is declining oaks dec and um, rapidly dying oak trees. And so um, in 2018, we started to see a lot of rapid die off of um, some of our larger oaks. So you can see um, one of the field surveys that I did was in at the National Arboretum in uh, September 2019. And you can see here is an oak that had rapidly died off that summer, as well as oaks surrounding it that are perfectly fine. And so one of the things that we were talking about was is what's causing this die off and decline? And um, is it oak wilt? And so um, a lot of people were curious. And so we started a survey. And what the survey found was, is that it's not oak wilt. So here you can see um, some of the results that we had found. So we took samples, both leaf and branch samples and sent them to the University of Maryland Plant Diagnostic Lab. And so there was only one sample in our um, in these two years that was positive for oak wilt, and that was in a known area that had had oak wilt in the past in Allegheny County. The other things that we've been able to find are bacterial leaf scorch, or this orange or yellow color here. That's um, th the xylella. So that's a disease that we've known has been in the environment affecting street trees, but seems to be affecting both um, urban and um, trees within a forest. So that's 
across the state. Um, so you can see that's, you know, from Allegheny to Cecil down to Somerset County, we found positives for bacterial leaf scorch. In addition, we also took soil samples. And in those soil samples, we were able to look for soil pathogens. So one of um, the soil pathogens that was found was this Phytophthora cinnamoni. This is not Phytophthora remorum or sudden oak death. This is um, a different type of Phytophthora. And so you can see um, the Phytophthora has also been found throughout the state. You can see that green color has been found in um, a majority of the samples, more in 2019 than in 2020. And in addition, we also have another disease called Diplodia corticula that's newer into the environment, but you can see that it's basically spread throughout the state. That's the purple color. So you can see it's in Allegheny County across to Cecil and again down to Somerset and across the um, both Southern Maryland and in um, Central Maryland. So it's a disease that we had initially thought might have been causing some of these issues, but it seems to be pretty widespread and it's not always there. And in addition, there has been a couple other pathogens that have been identified that are also secondary pests. So there are diseases that usually attack weakened trees. And so those are in the blue color. And so you can see there's a lot going on um, inside of the disease complex. And so there's no real smoking gun currently that says that um, this disease or pathogen is causing this oak decline. So here is the 2021 samples that we um, were able to um, have information on so far. So, so far they've only, we've only found Diplodia in two of the sample, two of the four samples that were taken in June. So um, that's what we found so far in 2021. Um, if you want to look at it a different way, um, so here is all the 2020 samples. So here in this top corner here is all of the samples um, that were, were looked for for oak wilt. You can see none of them are positive. Here is where Phytophthora was found. The reds are the positive for Phytophthora. They were on the Eastern shore. There was no Phytophthora found on the Western shore last year. The bacterial leaf scorch, you can see it's from um, Somerset through um, the Northeast and across through Baltimore. And then for the Diplodia corticula, um, you can see it's from the Pennsylvania line to the Virginia line, basically. And so, again, it's just a, another way to kind of look at what I had just been showing you with the pie charts. Uh, we do look, I said, you know, that those Phytophthora that we found were Phytophthora cinnamoni. We do look for Phytophthora remorum or sudden oak death using a stream bait survey. And so, these um, streams that you can see here, um, the points are in blue, are near areas that have um, nursery stock that um, is known to um, be a sudden oak death um, harbinger. And so I'm not saying that these areas have um, Phytophthora remorum positive nursery stock, it's just a vehicle that could um, bring Phytophthora remorum into the state. And so this is where we're surveying. And all of these um, were negative. So there is no Phytophthora remorum in the state of Maryland um, in our native environment, which is good. Um, in addition, you know, so I talked about all the diseases with the oak pests, but we also do an oak commodity survey. And here you can see are the four insects that we're looking for. We're looking for oak splendor beetle. It's, um, you might think it, it does look um, a bit like emerald ash borer. Um, so it is also an agrilis. Uh, we have the oak processionary moth and two bark beetles, the European hardwood ambrosia beetle and the oak ambrosia beetle. And so you can see where we've set these up across the state in areas that have um, declining oaks. And we weren't able to find any of these species. So um, each one is trapped a little differently. The oak splendor beetle is, is done with a visual survey. The oak processionary moth is done with like a, basically a small sticky board with a wing trap and a pheromone lure. And then the two bark beetles are done with uh, those black linger and funnel traps and a um, lure pheromone. But all of them were negative. So again, 
with the whole oak decline complex, it looks like it's most likely a combination of diseases weakening the tree, as well as our environment is um, been rough. And so, you know, we had had several years of uh, very wet years followed by a drought. And so all of these issues are kind of stressing these oak trees out and uh, we think are causing this decline in mortality. In addition, we also trap for exotic bark beetles. Um, and you can see we only do this um, about every five years. And so this is funded through the US Forest Service and it's called Early Detection Rapid Response. So the bark beetles that we're looking for are new. And so this would be the early detection part of it. And then if we happen to find anything, then we would um, start the RR or the rapid response. And so the whole purpose of the story is this survey is to find these bark beetles early so that we're able to do have a rapid response, do delineation and be able to um, start any sort of um, management of, this, of these insects. So we did not find any um, exotic bark beetles this year. We did find bark beetles that are non-native but are known to our environment and have been known to not cause mortality. And so you can see I put the top four pictures of the top four beetles that we collected right here on the map. So Xylosandrus, Xyloborinus, another Xylosandrus, and a Snestus. And so um, they're all very small, two to five milliliters, two to five millimeters at most. And uh, so we um, so we found those, but um, we didn't find anything else exciting. So good news. Emerald ash borer. So we do, are still doing work on emerald ash borer. We trap for emerald ash borer in our non-positive counties, as well as our parasitoid release locations. Uh, we do still have uh, parasitoid release locations. We release parasitoids at six different locations in 2020 and in 2021. And we also assist with tree treatments. So uh, these tree treatments are done on public land. So um, Nature Conservancy properties, the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge has properties along the Nanticoke River that we assist with treatments as well as state park land. And so I'll go through each of those individually. So where did we find emerald ash borer in 2021? In all the areas that we knew that it was. So in our parasitoid release locations. We did not find any in Wicomico or Worcester counties, which are two counties that have not been able to, um, we have not been able to find emerald ash borer yet. So those counties are still not positive for EAB. Uh, here's our, where our parasitoid release locations were, Caroline, Cecil, Hereford, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Garrett County. What are we releasing? We're releasing an egg parasitoid, Oobius agrilli, that's here. These are very, very small. This is an EAB egg. So um, it's roughly the size of an emerald ash borer egg. We do release two species of Spathius, which is a larval parasitoid. They have these nice long ovipositors to be able to drill through the bark to get to the larvae of EAB, as well as another, another larval parasitoid, Tetrasticus plenipensi. And these larval parasitoids are, oops, are typically re, um, released as um, inside of blocks. And so the blocks of wood come out and then here is a Tetrasticus right here. And so you can see from that block of wood, they are very small. Um, we have released them across the state um, since 2009. The majority of this work was research work that was done in the initial EAB phase down here in um, Prince George's and Charles County. So if you do remember, there was, we did try to eradicate EAB down here. Um, and so that was why a lot of the parasitoid work was done in this area to start off with, um, but it has expanded across the state as EAB has expanded across the state. And so this year, oh, I don't have the table, but we were able to release 15,000 parasitoids this year at those six locations. Here is where we treated trees for emerald ash borer. So, um, here you can see here are our systems. They're the same systems that are used for the trunk injections for hemlock lily gelgid. Here's a pressure somebody pressurizing one of the pumps, and then here's the system going into the tree. And so 
the kind of exciting thing is that we're doing a lot of these natural areas. And so we've so far treated um, almost 30 natural area clusters. So you can see where all these natural areas are. And so we're treating clusters so that the trees, we are treating both female and male trees so that we can save seed stock for the future. And so another interesting thing about these natural areas is that a lot of them are along waterways. And so sometimes we have to kayak in to be able to get to these trees. And so um, it's very wet, but um, it's really, it's quite a different um, and interesting environment to be in. And so we're hoping that as we treat these trees um, into the future, that we're able to save some trees to be able to provide seed stock um, so that once the initial wave of emerald ash borer is through, these trees can then start to thrive. Southern pine beetle. So here's what southern pine beetle looks like. This is an adult southern pine beetle, a grain of rice. And then this is a larger, um, another larger pine beetle um, that's mostly in the base of the trees um, that's also native. So here's what it looks like from egg through adult, egg through adult. And then here's the kind of damage that it causes. It can cause when the trees die quickly, it has these bright, um, orange red needles. They have popcorn tubes that come out of their pitch holes. They also have a blue stain fungus associated with them. So here you can see a blue stain fungus throughout the tree. And then as a population moves, the beetle will move as well as the mortality. So you can see here, this is, these are all dead um, loblolly pines in Dorchester County. You can see as it moved through, it um, started to move towards this area here, but a uh, clear cut was done here and it stopped the beetle movement. And so a lot of these beetles are um, dealing with pheromones. And so a clear cut on the edge of an area for Southern pine beetle helps to disrupt the pher pheromone movement inside of the forest and helps the population um, start to die back. So in 2021, we found no um, high populations of southern pine beetle. All the green dots are where we did find southern pine beetle, but they were either so low um, that, they, that the population is basically declining. We did find one trap here in Charles County uh, where we did find moderate populations of southern pine beetle. And so we did a ground survey and two drone surveys looking for that kind of orange tree, dead dying populations um, of mortality of trees where the beetles could be moving and we found nothing. And so um, this beetle is not causing damage in this area, it is just there in higher numbers. In addition, a lot of these areas that we're looking at for Southern pine beetle are also affected by saltwater intrusion. So here you can see we do an aerial flight damage for saltwater intrusion looking at it. Um, we uh, map all areas of uh, affected forests and then we go back through and we look at those and then we try to determine if it's affected by saltwater intrusion or if there's an additional pest. And so for the majority of these areas, it's uh, just saltwater intrusion. Uh, Southern pine beetle populations are just not that high. And so we, last year we found 50,000 acres of saltwater um, affected forests and the majority of those were in Dorchester County. Um, in addition, there's a few other things that are kind of of note. We did have an area where walking stick defoliated trees. So it's about 41 acres in Washington County. Uh, forest tent caterpillar affected about 350 acres in Wicomico County. You can see it's kind of similar um, to where uh, some of the gypsy moth was. And then this is the damage map from um, 2020, not 2021. So there was only 1,700 acres of defoliation from gypsy moth, um, whereas this year it's 30,000. So and then finally, I did wanna just put a little bug in your ear for spotted lanternfly in Maryland. So if you see spotted lanternfly, um, the plant protection section, not my section in forest pest management, but plant protection does have an online survey where you can submit it. So all you need to do is Google spotted lanternfly reporting Maryland, and uh, you should be able to find this online survey. And then also they are no longer accepting citing reports from Harford and Cecil because they are very 
well aware that, that those populations are very high. And so um, unfortunately, uh, the populations are there and they're expanding. And so those areas are currently quarantined for spotted lanternflies. So if you wanna know more about the quarantine, I suggest um, just going to MDA's website. And then here's what spotted lanternfly looks like in case you needed a reminder. Here's an egg mass for spotted lanternfly and then um, all the way through the adult. So there you go. So, and if you can always email them at don'tbug period MD at maryland.gov. And so if you have any questions, um, here's all of our uh, information uh, for all of our regional offices. And um, thank you very much. Great, that was great. Uh, thank you, Heather. That was a great update, quick and done. You got a lot of information jam packed in like less than 50 minutes. That was great. Um, <laughs> since we just talked about the spotted lantern fly, um, right now, what is it in an instar? If we were to think of what it looks like right now, are we looking for those instars or are we looking, You're looking for, that? for egg masses? Egg masses. So once the first frost happens, a lot of those adults will die off. And so now all that we see are egg masses. Mm -hmm. Those are egg masses can be everywhere. They really love to lay egg masses on steel, on rocks, on any non-natural substance that is outside, uh, cars, trailers. Uh, so really they could be on almost anything. So let's all work together to keep our eye out for that. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I think what it's one of those things, I think once you see it, I, this is at least with the gypsy moth, because I, I haven't seen a spotted lantern fly yet. But once I seen gypsy pot, a moth uh, nest on, on a tree trunk, very identifiable and easy to kind of train your eye to that very quickly. So so that was good. And then I think, do you think that's the same with the spotted lantern fly that it kind of becomes like, oh, now I see it. I... Yeah, I think um, just, you know, practicing looking for that kind of light, light gray colored egg mass. Um, it's definitely, you can definitely train yourself to look for it. Yeah. Um, yep. So yeah, Hartford and Cecil are really where you can get a good look for them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So. Um... Let's keep our fingers crossed. What and that that you know quarantine and all of us are working together to to make sure that it's uh, staying in its spot. So that's great. Um, you mentioned something about the University of Maryland Plant Diagnostic Lab. So mm -hmm. you know I get a lot of people. Uh, well, not a lot, but like some people say, it's bringing me something or showing sending me a picture of something, saying, "What is this?" Um, so can the, do you have to be a scientist like you, or do you have to be working for that at the Ag Center to send this information to them or ask them? No, the plant diagnostic lab is open for all citizens. And so um, I would just, like I said, just Google uh, University of Maryland plant diagnostic lab. And so Karen Rain's information is there and uh, she has a whole form you can fill out. You can submit her um, pictures or you can submit her an actual physical sample. And so um, for the most part, the offices and labs in College Park are open. Uh, you just need to kind of uh, coordinate with them when they would be available to take actual samples versus just pictures. Okay, so then if I'm gonna type in my Google search, University of Maryland Diagnostic Lab. Is that plant, plant okay. diagnostic lab? Mm -hmm. Don't forget that one because we yep. we're going to diagnose if we send them a piece of wood. You never know. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that's good to hear. And then, um, so I I have in my notes here the quarantines are based on the finding the beech tree diseases. Wow. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know why that hit me hard out of everything that you said. Um, seeing those three images there were was um, was a little striking for me, and I'm not sure why it kind of hit me a little harder than the other ones. But um, are there quarantines for 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 that? There see, just seems to be multiple things affecting them. Yeah, there's no current quarantines for either beech leaf disease or beech bark disease. So okay. beech bark disease has been in our in our environment for a long time. And so um, trees have just been able to, um, to live with the infection. And so um, 
but with beech leaf disease, I think the problem is, is that they are, you know, fairly certain it's a nematode, but not 100% certain. And so there's just no, um, there's just no ability to, I guess, if they can't pinpoint what's exactly causing it, then they can't regulate it. Right. And so, um, beech leaf disease has been found to be able to be moved in nursery stock. So it is uh, something that, um, you know, if you're a nursery uh, person, you should be looking at and looking at your stock uh, that's coming in from other areas. But um, as far as actual quarantines or the need for an additional certification, uh, there's just no, uh, there's no current regulations. Okay. So, you know, I don't want to, you gave me a little bit of hope that, you know, the beach, you know, beach, okay, beach bark disease, they kind of can get through, you know, mm -hmm. they can live their life cycle. Maybe they're not living to their full potential, but um, they're living their life cycle. So we don't necessarily need to super freak out about that. Um, but that uh, a leaf, what, what? Yeah, the beech leaf disease is, it does look like it's more pathogenic and it's certainly causing mortality in lots of areas. And so okay. um, it is worrisome to be sure. Um, and we, it's, so new that we just don't know um, what what the trees in our environment are going to be able to do to fend it off in the future. Well, and as landowners and as forestry uh, professionals like loggers or uh, foresters, what a unique opportunity to kind of look up. You know, um, I think that people that are working in the woods forget to look up and see 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 what's happening sometimes in the woods and this is a great opportunity to kind of get on the underside of a, of a beech tree and see what's going on. You know, yeah. what would be interesting this time of year too, how they, um, the leaves stay on, but they mm -hmm. turn brown. So is there right. this time of year, will it kind of look the same? It'll still look the same. Yeah. I mean, the tones will be different certainly, but that the leaf discoloration will still be there. Okay. Okay. So even this time of year, uh, we can still kind of notice the, 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 that the, the leaf color is a little bit off. It's not, it's not the usual like same color. It's, it's not that like light green versus dark green or even the yellowing, but the damage is there. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That one hit me that, that beach bark. I don't know why it hit me so much. Uh, you said something real neat, and I think I'm paraphrasing what you said here. So, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here. Insect husbandry is what is what you guys are doing there. So you guys are raising some of your own uh, helpful little buddies there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really the insectary. And uh, we're trying to add an additional insectary that seems to be working, but is fairly new. I think it's one of those things that's just a really great project. It's something that we can start raising ourselves and not necessarily needing to have to go out west to collect to like Oregon or Washington to collect more beetles or even to have them reared in a lab. If you know, you can actually set up these areas that are um, really well suited for the beetle that then the beetle can then work for you. Wow. Full waste. <laughs> so yeah, wow. it's, it's a really interesting project. Mm -hmm. You know, Heather, uh, you know, just to put a bug in your brain, Hey, uh, if you're ever given tours on the insectary, mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to help you organize something like that. People okay. would be very curious about that. Keep me, keep yeah. me because I, I, that would be a great tour. I'd love to help you organize something like that. Um, so, you know, I just did a talk the other day and I was talking about different types of cuts and why, you know, harvesting cuts, why would we do specific harvest cuts? Now in your work, I heard that you're set, you, you do uh, the monitoring and then you do some spraying, um, and you do do some other methods to get to, you know, the biological controls and stuff. Do you do any salvage cuts? Do you do much forestry work to kind of block the, 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 the movement of these insects or, you know, any, any? So with Southern pine beetle, we would certainly, certainly be doing more of that, but um, we just don't have the populations to, um, to have the need for the funding to do that kind of stuff. And so um, 
in our, for Southern pine beetle, if we did have it in some of our state forests, then we would be looking at where the beetle was moving to be able to do some salvage cuts and be able to stop the beetle movement as well as thinning. Hmm. Um, thinning is a really good, making sure that you have the healthy, um, the right stocking amount of your trees is, um, is another thing that's going to prevent Southern pine beetle from being able to grab hold as well as um, some of the other pine pests like Cyrex noctilio or would be really able to grab a hold of a, um, a overstocked stress stand. And so um, both of those pests certainly, even just um, you know proper management would be a really um, good way to kind of keep them at bay. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's some that's some great 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 stuff to think about, right? And and that mm -hmm. diversity. So if we are kind of uh, mm -hmm. noticing that our 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 landscape was maybe planted a little bit with one sort of plant, one sort of tree, then maybe we want to think about that succession of the land and 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 adding some diversity into the into the mix of those trees. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. That's great. Um, and, and, and that for and, and that forestry practices can be important when it comes to, uh, you know, that, that that stewardship. You know, these forestry harvesting practices are can be a form of stewardship and can aid in making sure that you know the rest of the trees in, in Maryland. Are, are safe. And I liked how you said, you said a very, very interesting thing that the trees are stressed. Yeah. The, the, mm -hmm. these insects and these diseases are super smart they yeah. grow after the weak ones. Yep. Yeah. And, um, so a lot of what our lures are is stress tree smells. And so, um, if that tells anybody anything, it's, you know, we want to try to keep our trees as healthy as we can to keep these pests from moving in. Yeah, interesting. You know, we could talk a little bit more. I was just thinking about um, decomposition and what that means mm. a little bit deeper, but Heather, we don't have time for that because uh, I, I do want to ask some professionals some questions about what they think about my thinking. Anyway, but that's not, now's not the time. So you guys, um, any other thoughts or questions out there? Heather, do you have anything uh, else to add or some a, a shout out you want to give to somebody or something about your great year that you had or, or a program that's coming up? Anything you want to? So I'll just say um, we did just hire our new Western regional entomologist. So Patrick Simons will be moving out to our Western region. So um, we're very excited to have him on board as an entomologist. And uh, to be servicing out there in uh, Garrett, Allegheny, and Western Washington counties. Great, great, great. Nice to have yes. a nice to have a big team. Okay, and Heather, we are grateful that you're here for our last Woodland Wildlife Wednesday for the for 2021. Uh, I, I'm excited about our new look we're going to have for Woodland Wildlife Wednesday, Woodland and Wildlife Wednesdays next year. So come on back. And Heather, we're excited to that, and we're hoping that you're going to have a productive 2021 and that your field work is going to go smooth and that, um, you know, you're going to have some great, even more great news because you had some good news within, within our talk today that you're going to have some more good news for us for next year's forest pest update. Thank you, Heather, for your time. Thank you.